Okay, good evening and uh, welcome to Bible study. Um, if you can do me the usual thing of, you know, share, like and comment as you come on. And I will just do this myself. There we go. So if you can share, if you can like, and if you can comment as you come on, it makes the world a difference for us. Um, I'm going to do it myself. So let me just share. Here we go. And we will get started tonight. We're going to be looking at a few different things, but we're going to be looking primarily at Genesis 14. And from Genesis 14, we're going to be looking at battle targets. You know, we're always in a spiritual battle, but what are the targets in this battle? What are we supposed to be looking at? Where's our focus supposed to be? Hi, Linda. Hi, Lawrence. Hi, Simon. Um, and guys, if you do me the favor, if you just help us get out, we have been restricted as a page. How you do? So the best thing to do is just take a second and just um, share, like, and comment and just help us get out. It makes the world a difference. And if I can remember how to do this myself. Uh, um, oops, I don't know what I've done. So share, share. Um, bear with me. If you just take a second, again, say hi as you come on. Um, and I will share here and let me see if I can share it off this. This would be easier. So we're going to look, like I said, at Genesis 14. And we're going to be looking at it in the context of different things that have been happening, such as what's been happening with Davos and, and different things like that. Oh, who's that? Why am I not seeing them? So again, if you can like, if you can share, if you can comment, it makes, like I said, the world a difference for us. I'm just going to see if I can do it off a different page. It just makes it easier for me. Um, let me see. Boop. So open your Bibles up at Genesis 14. And we'll go from there. We are just going to take a second. Uh, let me see if I can share. Yay, I can share it now. Share. Let me see. Boom. So again... Open your Bibles to Genesis 14. Hiya, John. Um, and we will get started. And the whole context of this, the whole context of Genesis 14, it is the first battle that we see. It is the first kind of uh, war that we see within the Bible. Um, Hiya, William. And it is it's worthwhile taking a note of it because, you know, if anybody is kind of not aware of this, but we're living in battle times. We're living in a battleground right now. We're seeing so many things hyper um, going to hyper speed in the unfolding, and we're seeing so many things to be brought into to uh, are manifested in front of us right now in the sense of the unfolding of convergence of prophecy. Um, but as such, it's time for the church to really press in to really focus on you know, the calling that God has for us, because, you know, if you go into a battle, if you go into a conflict, or perhaps you're going through a battle, a spiritual battle right now, I think it's prudent of us to have our sights set on what God wants our sights set on. You know, um, I think in the midst of any battle, whether you're going through one now, or whether you went through one before recently, or you're going to go through one in the future, because you are, one of the th things that the enemy does is he tries to distract your focus from where it should be. He tries to distract your attention from where it should be. And he tries to make sure that you're not able to take aim. And there's a scripture in 1 Kings, I think it's 22, 34. And it talks about um, in the midst of a battle, one random guy in this battlefield takes aim with a bow randomly and that arrow is launched across the battlefield and it hits King Ahab through his armor, it goes through his armor and just boom, pierces it and I know it's said at random but I don't believe it is at random, I believe that God is guiding your eyes to the target and what your target should be in the midst of battle, so guys um, let me just get back to my live here, there we go, so we're just going to crack on and um, let's look at uh, Genesis 14 and like I said, I want to look at it in the context of what is happening and the things that we're seeing right now. Um, so there's what happens. There's a, a, a 
confederacy in Genesis 14 of four kings. These four kings come against five kings. And in fact, these four kings have subjugated these five kings for 12 years. And then the 13th year hits and the five kings rebel. And as they rebel, you notice that throughout the story, I'm going to give you a quick overview. Throughout the story, Abraham stays out of it. He doesn't get involved. He stays away. Hi, Helen. Um, hiya, Gary. So, guys, if you're coming on, please take a second and just share, uh, just like, and just comment if you can. Um, so, in this story in Genesis 14, the four kings go to war against the five kings because the five kings have rebelled and refused to be subjugated by the four kings anymore. It is basically a standing up against... Um, a standing up against tyranny, a standing up against things like that. Abraham stays out of it until the four who win the battle take Lot and all of Lot's family, and they take them and take Lot's family into captivity. And then Abraham steps up and he steps up. I'm giving you a quick overview before we look at the scripture. He steps up, he grabs 318 of his own men who he has trained since birth in the arts of war. And those 318 led by his head servant, Eliezer, go to war. And they take on the four king confederacy that has defeated the five king nation, nations. His, his, this, this one man's army takes them on, right? And as he takes them on, he is able to take back all the goods and all the spoils of war, including his family. And at the end of the chapter, we'll see that he goes to Melchizedek and he offers a tithe to Melchizedek. And it is all about being in the, that king and priesthood thing that uh, we're all called to be in Roman uh, Revelation 1.6. But let's start looking at this scripture. And I want to look at the, the names that are said here, right? So it says in verse uh, one, and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of El Elazar, um, this one's harder to say, uh, Kedor Lamor, right, king of Elam. Now he's the head of this confederacy and title king of nations. So this is the four king confederacy. I want to give you their, what their, their names actually mean, right? Amraphel means one that speaks in secret, right? So in other words, it's talking about, you know, uh, nefarious plans, speaking in secret, gathering things together, having a nefarious plan that is not out in the open. Aria talks about being a fierce lion. Oh, there's William put it, a roaring like lion seeking whom he can devour. Yes, First Peter 5, 8. And that is what Aria is a picture of. So if you look at this four king nation, it's a globalist um picture or shadow that we can apply to nowadays to see where our target should be in the midst of battle. Then you've got uh, you've got uh, Kador Lamor, right, whose name, uh, it's not so much about his name, but he, he was a pantheist. His name means servant, but he was a servant of um, this, he was a servant of a pantheist false god of the dawn. Right. I'm sorry, I'm getting loads of messages as I, I'm talking here and it's really distracting. So Kador Lamor is a servant of a pantheist false god. He's a Persian uh, pantheist false deity, right, that he's a, a servant of. And this servant is known as the god of the dawn, a.k.a. the morning, a.k.a. the morning star, a.k.a. Uh, Isaiah 14, verse 2, which refers to Satan, Lucifer, as the morning star, right? So I'm giving you a picture of this because I believe that this four king nation represents uh, like something like Simon's put up here, a dark council, a, a globalist regime. And then you have title. Title literally means great son, but it also means ruler of nations. It's talking about a confederacy. It's talking about globalism. Um, so whenever you look at this. You can take these four nations and you can break it down and say, oh, right, you know, they're not exactly good guys. In fact, the five nations that they're fighting aren't exactly good guys. The four nations and the five nations, they are not great, right? Though there's one who stands as righteous, who is also called a friend of God. And that one is Abraham himself. And he stands separate and righteous. And he is a friend of God, right? But the four king nations, right? They are Shemites. So you remember that if we go back to Genesis 9. And actually, Genesis 8 and then Genesis 9 and 10 are the table of nations. You have Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. Shem 
is the lineage that will eventually bring about um, the birth of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, so that, that's that lineage. Ham is the cursed child of um, Noah, because Ham commits an abomination of exposing Noah's nakedness. We've talked about that time and time again. It literally means sleeping with his father's wife. Um, and that's from the book of Leviticus. So when we look at that, that's Ham. Ham's lineage represents the five nations and the four nation confederacy is from Shem's lineage. Now, I just want you to be aware of that. Then we go into this uh, five nation, right? This five nation confederacy that they make war with, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Beresha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zelbim, and the king of Bela. Now, to understand that, again, we break down the names. They're not great names. They don't necess necessitate great people. In fact, you know that Sodom and Gomorrah are in there. So you wouldn't turn around and say, these guys are great, right? And I'm going to give you the meaning and the application to now and what it means for us as believers in the 21st century in these end of the church age, in these end times, what it means for us. So Bera means son of evil, right? It's not a great name. Bersha means son of wickedness. Again, not great. Shinab is taken from two words, Shina or Shana, which means to turn, and Ab, which is for father, and it means the father has turned, right? Now, we know that that's something that we see later on with Sodom and Gomorrah. The father turns his back on Sodom and Gomorrah for the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah to happen, right? Shemaber is known for being strong, and Bela means destruction. Now, what I want to point out, like I've said before, these two do not represent two great forces. They do not represent two. One isn't uh, the good guy and one isn't the bad guy. They are both bad, right? If you look at the Hamites, Hamites is, and, and the lineage of the, the curse of Cain, it's all about sexual sin, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's all about sexual sin and delving into sexual sin and so on. But we know that Lot had pitched his tent towards Sodom. In fact, he became... Um, someone at the gate, which meant somebody had noted authority at Sodom. So the Hamites have not got a good reputation, but the Shemites are these globalists. And in this, in this four-nation confederacy, they represent the globalist regime. And when you look at this, I think there's a picture that we see right now. In Romans 1, it talks about um, a time in which man will be given over to the depraved and debased mind. Why? Because they choose not to acknowledge and remember God in their thoughts. Now, what are the what's the results of the debased mind? It's man will lust after man, woman will lust after woman. It's talking about sexual debauchery. It's talking about emergence of a globalist regime in Romans one that worships the creation rather than the creator, and those embroiled in a sexual sin where sex is all what it's about. It's all about sex, according to this, right? So it's a picture of the end time. Now, here's the thing. If you take this as an overall view, you have one force of a four-nation confederacy. You have one force of a five-nation confederacy. The four nations of globalism subdue the five nations, take them into captivity, but that, you know they're still living how they were living, right? Now, within that, I think that's a picture of these times where you're seeing globalism bring in uh, the, like, like, let everybody identify in whatever sexual terms that they want, whether they're a goat, cat, whatever it is, they identify in whatever sexual terms that they want. And they walk in those sexual terms and they embroil in those sexual terms. Why? Because it allows them to be subjugated. It keeps them confused. And this is what we are seeing right now where we're seeing confusion usher in and we're seeing that when people are confused they're easier to lead now i want to talk to you tonight about being laser focused in the battle and i personally believe that each and every one of you who are on here tonight uh, that you are laser focused that you have the spirit of god as your lens and you see everything through the word and the spirit of god and as such i believe that you can see past the, the 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 battle to see where your aim should be now where we what we notice is abraham whenever he finds out that lot is nephew but he calls him his brother in scripture here whenever we see this 
he doesn't sit, he doesn't wait, he goes after a lot. And I want to get to that, right? But I want to go a wee place first, okay? So verse 3, all these joined together in the Valley of Sidon. That is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedar Lamer, right? And in the 13th year they rebelled. 13 is the number of rebellion. In the 14th year, Kedar I can't say this name, and the kings that were with them came and attacked the Rephaim. Now, who were the Rephaim? Who were the, the Rephaim? Who were they? They were the, the, the emergence of the Nephilim post-flood, right? They were the, they were the giants. They were the men of renown. They're also um, called the walking dead. Now, I want you to picture this, right? You look at what is happening around the world now. You look at what is happening with globalism. I'm going to talk about the WF in a second. You look at what is happening with globalism right now. What is the first thing that the globalists have done? And we've seen this from 2020. They have taken and they have put in their sights the giants, the global giants of tech, the global giants of industry, they have accumulated them all together to end the globalist regime. In other words, they were their first port of call. And this is a strategy you see with the enemy. The enemy goes after the big ones first, goes after the men of renown, goes after the giants, goes after the Nephilim, goes after the Rephaim, right? Goes after the Rephaim, aka the walking dead. That's what they're also called, right? They're, they're people... They're talked about as in the sense that the Rephaim, they used to be in Genesis 6, 1 to 4, Nephilim. But then the flood comes, but they're still alive. So they're referred to as Rephaim, right? As in they are born, they're still alive. They're rehealed. They're respawned. They're walking dead, right? And that is literally talking for me, when I think about this in an allegorical sense, it is talking in the sense of nowadays, people who are oblivious, they are basically walking through in a zombified state, believing everything that is pushed through mainstream media, everything that is pushed through the TV and everything that is pushed through, you know, what such and such said and what, you know, they read in the newspaper, they're believing it and they're going with it. And this is the how the enemy works. This is how the Confederacy, this is how globalism starts. It's how it goes. It goes after the giant first. So what we see nowadays is the globalist rate, uh, the growing of globalism. And listen, it's not conspiracy theory. It's out there for all to see. We'll talk about some of the stuff that WEF have said recently. Um, with the growth of globalism, they target partnership and subduing of giants of tech. Those big ones of tech, those Twitter, the, the Facebook and YouTube and all of that. That's why uh, the likes of Elon Musk isn't very popular. In fact, he is seen as um, an adversary of the WEF. And that's why there was so much resistance to him taking over Twitter, because they had already subdued big tech. Do you understand that if you're getting what I'm trying to say, I've got a lot of distractions going on because I can hear my kids outside. So. If you're getting what I'm trying to say, please hit one. Let me know you're on board here. And I want you to look at some of the things, right? The big talking point at the WEF last month, the big talking point at the WEF last month, WEF 2022, was environmental social governance, right? Now, I want you to understand where this is, what this means, right? We've talked about this since last year. We talked about environmental social governance. I showed you that MasterCard had signed on to this way last year. And they're trying it. They were trying it in Holland, I think, where they were you MasterCard were uh, if it was used in a petrol station, and they believed that you were going above the the need that you had for petrol. MasterCard would have a cutoff switch to what you can actually spend. Now that's something on a lower scale, but ESGs, environmental social governments, is seen as a way of measuring the environmental um, contribution a company, a state, and an individual makes, right? We are seeing companies such as BlackRock, Microsoft, Apple, all put ESGs now on their website. Now, what does that mean? They are saying and going, yes, no, look, we are good ESG, environmental social governance company. Despite the fact that uh, Microsoft and Apple, they are mining uh, for our and ore and stuff in different countries and wrecking the, 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 uh, well, the third world countries, so it doesn't really count to them, but they're wrecking the, the landscape. Or you have other, other big companies that make the ESG, you know, best, 
based uh, company list, such as Amazon, Amazon that requires fossil fuels to get all of their deliveries done, Amazon that have been up in the uh, and, and documentaries for how bad they treat their workers that they can't even go to the toilet. Um, or, or Uber. Uber's on the, the best company list. Uber is on the best company list, yet a company like Tesla has been chucked off the list. Now, I'm saying this for a purpose, right? When you see a battle coming, when you see Genesis 14 showing you a battle, you have to understand that the first part of the battle for the, the, the globalist is to subdue the giants, to subdue the Rethian, right? Now, they subdue them either through compromise where the giants come on board with them or they subdue them through conquest. And that's what's trying to happen. So Elon Musk stood out in defiance against the puppet of the WEF, Mr. Joe Biden. Um, he stood out in defiance and he argued with them over Twitter. And as such, his company, which is probably one of the biggest companies for uh, producing clean, uh, efficient uh, cars and electric cars around the world, were chucked off the actual list. Um, were chucked off the actual list. Guys, don't... Um, and as they were chucked off the list, you're seeing GM Motors, Ford, be high up on the list. Okay. So it's kind of it's kind of crazy. It shows you that that an idea of an environmental social governance is just a way of conquest. It's just a way of picking your team. It is not about the environment. It is not about the environment. Okay. So when you understand this, like even if you take it, Tesla is nowhere to be found on the ESG best uh, companies list. It was kicked out of the list for this is the quote for lack of low carbon strategy compared to Amazon, compared to Uber, compared to all of them companies that are, uh, you know, I guess, pumping diesel into their veins uh, and for poor working conditions, they, it's crazy that, the, but what it is, is the drawing the lines of teams. If you remember whenever, you know, PE or, you know, whenever you had to pick a team and you pick the best ones on your team, what you're seeing happening right now in the world is the growth of confederacies. You're seeing one team over here and one team over here. And the world gets smaller as globalism tries to stamp its authority. This is true. This is true historically. This is true biblically. This is true now. We see it. The world gets smaller as globalism stretches out further. And in that, you know, what we're seeing within the WEF, I said this last night. I don't know if I've got the quote. Um, I might have just, because I tend not to keep notes. Um, I don't think I have actually. No, um, but there was a quote from Klaus Schwab, and it was basically ripping off Matthew twenty-four. The quote was: um, "These days there are plagues, pestilence, disease, earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars." AKA that is straight out of Matthew twenty-four. Um, but Klaus Schwab has said this, right? The head of the WF, and it. Whereas in Matthew 24, when it's given as a warning, we are told to look up. We're told that our blessed hope will return. We know that from Titus 2. We're told to hold fast to the word of God. We're told to not to grow loveless, but to, to grow in love. We're told to hold on to him. Klaus Schwab has said the alternative. He says salvation can be found at Davos, at their meeting at the WEF. In other words, this is what's happening in the world. We got all the answers. Do you understand the lines are being drawn? When, when you see a battle on the horizon, what you see first off is the, the you know, one army over here, one army over there, and they're starting to take their positions and the battle positions have been drawn. Now, where do you come into this? Where do I come into this? What do we do in this sort of process? You know, what's our focus? And this is what I want to talk to you about. We're seeing that all of this lit line up, every sign, if he who has an eye to see and an ear to hear, should notice the signs, seasons, and times that we're in, like the sons of Issachar, right? You know, we're looking right now as we hit um, the 5th of June there. So as we hit Pentecost, it was the start of the lineup of uh, the greatest planetary parade where the planets all go in one line to the, to the eye. Um, they're not really in one line, right? But the greatest planetary parade in a thousand years. Right. And what happened a thousand years ago, guys? 
A thousand years ago in terms of the church was what we call the great schism where the church divided. Now there's going to be a division. It's going to be you're either on this side or you're on this side. When the, the teams are being drawn, when you're being picked, you can't stand there and say, well, I want to be immune. You need to be either on the side of Christ or on the side of the world, on the side of globalists. Now, I want you to, to, to be aware of this. There's so much lining up. You know, we see within that planetary parade, it's just, it's not by uh, chance that it, I'm talking about having a prophetic eye. Let me, if you're getting what I'm saying, again, please step one, let me know that you're getting this. I'm talking about having a prophetic eye. The Queen's Jubilee was there, right? So we're, people were celebrating the Queen's Jubilee on Pentecost. Pente is 50, and Jubilee is based on the 50th year of celebration where the captives were set free, where anybody who had debt would pin it to their, their front of their tent, and a rich man would walk down it and absolve the tent and free, uh, absolve the debt and free the free the individual. It was about being set free. But in the time of Pentecost this year, I'm saying if imagine if this was a dream, right? God is showing you so much, and you have to have a prophetic eye to see. And what I'm saying is, is the Queen's Jubilee on Pentecost in Babylon, for instance. The Queen of Heaven is the, the wife of Nimrod. Her name is Samarimus. The Queen of Heaven is also who we know, according to Revelation 17, what represents the harlot of Babylon. So Samarimus was also a, a, a harlot of Babylon. She, that's what she was called. She was the harlot of Babylon. And we see the picture of that developing. And I'm saying if you're seeing a planetary parade, like it hasn't been seen in a thousand years, if Pentecost and the Queen's Jubilee are hitting the same date, where half the church is worshiping God and the other half are, are celebrating uh, a queen, you know, it's all about the, picking your side. It's all about, are you with this emerging? It's, I'm not saying I said anything about the queen, by the way. I'm saying that this is a prophetic simile and a, a, an allegory, a metaphor, so to speak, of what God is showing you. And God is saying, I personally believe, is showing you that there is a rise of a harlot system, there is a rise of a global confederacy, there is a rise of um, so many people embroiled us in sex and the, the sexual um, things and sexual identity have become their deity as opposed to God. We're living in that time. And the call upon the church is, is to be separate from it, is to be a friend of God like Abraham was. So Abraham doesn't get involved until there's a special commission to get involved. And the special commission is when Lot is taken, right? So after they attack Rephaim, they go down and then shows you the whole war. You can read through this. It's quite lengthy. I'm not going to do it right now. Um, and then what happens is we get to verse 14. Now, when Abraham had, I know it says Abraham, I'm just saying Abraham, it's easier, right? Now, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, now Lot is his nephew, but in this sense, he's calling him his brother, right? He armed his 318 servants who were born of his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, this is extremely important, right? 318, 318. Now, 318 has a, a meaning for us, right? So as, as the globalists subjugate those of a debased mind, that's what you're seeing as the fact the four, the globalist regime building, right? Subjugate the, the, those that are sons of evil, sons of wickedness, Bera and Bersha, um, the, the five nation confederacy. The target of everyone who's a friend of God is to set free the minds of those captive held captive and held hostage by the fear of this regime and the fear and the growth of globalism and the fear and the growth of, uh, of sex being the God rather than God being God. To, to let people, set people free from fear, set people free from the enemy, the call of the 318. Now, what does 318 mean in the Bible? And stay with us, right? Because there's a lot of, I believe there's a lot in this, right? 300 in Hebrew is represented by the letter Tav, which is also, I don't have a pen, which is, it, Tav is, it's kind of like a cross, 
It actually looks like a cross. So when you have the Aleph and the Tav, the, the Aleph is the ox, right? And that's the pictograph of the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav being the last letter and also a numerical value of 300. Tav is the cross, right? So, you know, you, you, you see this as a picture of Jesus, right? So 300 is a picture of the shape of the cross. It's a picture of being in the strength that walking and, and following the strength and the leading of Jesus. In the time of the battle, and the there's a battle happening, you need to realize that the general that you follow is Jesus Christ, that he is the one in which you're, you're subject to, that you are meek before. It is not meekness in the world standards, it's meekness before Jesus. It's taking a knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then you have 18. 18 in the Bible means bondage, but it actually typically means a release from bondage. The Philistines were held, uh, the Philistines held the Israelites captive for as slaves for 18 years, and then God raised the Samson, and boom, freedom for the Israelites. The Israelites had 18 judges before they had the king, and in other words, it's, it's 318 represents walking in under the cross, under the banner of the cross, being under the banner of cross, the cross, and serving the king. Right, that's who we serve. The three eighteen. Now here's a cool bit, right? Three eighteen also happens to be the geomatria of Eleazar, the chief servant of Abraham, the heir of Abraham. Right, so he was the heir of Abraham's house until Abraham had Isaac, and he doesn't have Isaac at this stage, right? So you have the the heir, the one who will inherit all of Abraham's stuff, all of Abraham's wealth, all of his great vastness of wealth is Eliezer, the chief servant, a born servant to Abraham. And in fact, the general of the 318. And his name adds up to 318. Are you getting this? I think this is kind of cool. I, I kind of like this, right? 318, right, is also the sum of all the prime numbers between seven, the perfect number of God, and seven squared, right? It's, it's the sum of all those prime numbers between 7 and 49. It's the sum of all those prime numbers between 7 and 7 squared, between God and God manifested and, and, and God multiplied and the spirit of God multiplied across the earth. In that, you have the 318. You have the sum of it, 318. And I'm saying right now, part of the call upon the church, when you see globalism stretch out its ugly arm, when you see the world stepping into the debased mind that we see in Romans 128. When you see man lusting after man, woman lusting after woman, when we see people losing their identity in Jesus Christ, including the church that is set in Matthew 16, 18, and instead walking in the sinking sand of a world's identity, your call and the call upon you is to be part as a bond servant and under a bond ser under a servant of bondage to Christ, as in we walk like Paul calls himself a bond servant, that we follow in perfect freedom, but we follow Christ. That's 318. It is the geomatria of Eliezer. Now, Eliezer, like I said, is the heir, right? The heir of Abraham's house. And, you know, when you look at this, the prime, the, 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 the 318, I think the nature of the 318, if, all, if, it's, uh, if it's the sum of all the prime numbers between seven and seven squared then the one of the things that you'll see as a, a character of these 318 is that they have a primary focus and the primary focus we see for us christians if the 318 were now the for us christians is to love the lord our god with all our heart mind and soul and to love our neighbors ourselves so this is the, the picture that i'm getting of the 318 and abraham sends them out he, he takes them out and he, he they go out and they get back all of what the enemy has stolen. All of what the enemy has stolen. It doesn't just say he gets back a uh, lot. In fact, I'll, I'll go on here, right? So it says he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hova, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods <laughs> he brought back all the goods right proverbs um as a proverb six says that if you catch the thief he has to restore to you sevenfold i'm saying that in the midst of this 
this is a picture and get this. I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully fill in the blanks with you. Let me know if I'm losing you. This is a picture of revival. He doesn't just get back love. He gets back all the goods. In the end times that we're in right now, there is a, a, an emerging globalist regime that is all around the world. We are talking about environmental social governance being the cue for social credit being used around the world right now. The biggest talking point in May 2022 in Davos was ESGs, right? They ignored the fact that there is worldwide famine predicted within the next 50 days. They ignored the fact that you know, the cost of living is skyrocketed and their focus was environment, excuse me, environmental social governance. And this is straight out of Romans 1, whenever they worship the creation rather than the creator, because the creation and the idea of the creation is in the earth, being and, and, and the sanctity of the earth, and, the, you know, we look after the earth, the earth is number one. That is a fallacy because we know that it represents the heart of the Babylon, right? It becomes Gaia worship and New Ageism, right? The worship of the earth. But we know by Revelation 17 that they never really had any heart to worship the earth. They never really cared about the earth. It was just a case of looting the earth of all of its riches and using it to bring in a globalist regime. This is straight out of Davos right now. In Romans 1, we know that it says, therefore God gave them up to the uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts. What's that talking about? The five nation confederacy of wickedness, of sinful, sinful debauchery. And then it says that they, in, in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Now, why does it say that? It says it in verse 25, they worship and serve the creature, earth, rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Now, this is what we're seeing happening now. And as it's happening now, I want you to read Genesis 14 again tonight and take it as an overall picture. The strategy of the enemy is globalism rises. The first thing that they do in verse five is they go to the Red BM, the giants, and they subdue the giants or they cause the giants to take a knee to them, right? So the giants, those who are the walking dead, that is literally what we have seen within this globalist rise right now, where since 2020, actually going back before that, because the WBAF has been around, well, it was a brainchild of Klaus Schwab 50 years ago, but it's been in its modern day form for at least 30 years. But you go back even a couple of years ago and you saw the increase of this where the Great Reset uh, um, and COVID-19, that's his book, by the way. That's Klaus Schwab, one of Klaus Schwab's books. The other one that I know Ian Lowe of is The Fourth Industrial Revolution. But as all of that is said, it is all about ushering in this globalist regime, this globalist system. And the way they did it in 2020 is that they um, formed alliances or subdued different um, giants of tech. And those giants of tech, then uh, they censored everybody from what they were saying, if it differed from the narrative, and they shut people off as, you know, you're just an extremist, you're this, that, and the other, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. And yet everything that people have been saying for the last two years has came to pass, but they are shut off, they're pushed to the side and told they're not, they're, they're crazy, right? Um, this is what the height, this is the strategy of the enemy. And if you recognize the strategy, you recognize the call of the 318. So the call of the 318 in this, if you understand this, the strategy of the enemy is to have this battle to subdue the wicked. And as the wicked are subdued, now you might think it's subdue the righteous. It's not initially, it's subdue the wicked, right? Um, you look, know that the enemy wants as many of people in his camp as possible, and he wants as many people blind to the things that he is doing, but still subservient to him as possible, right? Then the real target manifests, and the real target is those who are of God, right? I hope this is making sense. I'm probably losing you. Apologize if I am. Please let me know. Um, ben says, I don't serve that queen. Brilliant. <laughs> right? Um, so let me, let me know where you're at with this, right? So there, uh, if you're getting it, right? I want you to realize that the target in any battle is not random. If you're in a battle right now, if you're in a spiritual battle right now, you might think, oh, I'm just caught up on this. You know, it's financial, it's, it's relational, it's this, that, and the other, how it's manifested. Listen, the target is not random. 
there is always another target, right? So in this, Lot becomes a target, right? Lot is taken away. Lot, I, 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 who was righteous by affiliation, is taken away into captivity. And as he is righteous by affiliation, I'm saying that in the midst of this, in the midst of any battle running out in the world right now, any spiritual battle, the target that the enemy has in his sights are those people who are off to the side, who are not pressed into the kingdom, who are um, struggling, who are running dry, who are not praying, reading, spending time in his presence. They're his target. Now, it starts with the wicked. It starts with the wicked because they're easy to subdue, right? It starts with the five nations here because they're easy, easy to subdue. But the real target are the straggling sheep who go off to the side, the prodigals, right? So I said this last night to my mentoring group that whenever a, a wolf attacks a flock of sheep, it doesn't attack the whole flock. It tries to cut one off to the side. It tries to split one from the herd, right? Now, they are split one from the flock. This is what it does, right? And it's the same way the enemy attacks. The first port of call and the first identification of any spiritual attack in your life is isolation. You will feel isolated when the enemy tries to get you to isolate yourself, whether it's through shame, whether it's through uh, offense, whatever it is, tries to get you to isolate yourself. And what happens? You no longer read and you no longer spend time in the word. You no longer believe in the authority of the word. In fact, we see this in the book of Job. In Job 1, he attacks the, the well, I've said this before, he attack, the Sabians come in. The Sabians are technically slavers. They are people who want to subdue, a little bit like this four nation confederacy. They come in and they take away uh, Job's donkeys. Donkeys in typology in the Bible represent the authority of the word of God, okay? And they take away the oxen. The oxen, according to Deuteronomy, where it says, do not uh, muzzle the oxen, represents the pre preachers and teachers of the word of God. And the whole point, you'll see this, like, as a pastor, I know this. If someone's under spiritual attack, the first thing that happens is they just stop attending church, or they stop reading their Bible, or they stop praying, or they stop, and that's the first word of call. And that is what happens. And that is the first, that's, that's the real target in any battle, right? That's the real target of the enemy. So the enemy will subdue the easy ones to subdue first. He will subdue those who just go, oh, well, that's okay. You want me to take a mark? Yeah, I'll do it. But his real target is to bring off and reduce the flock of Jesus Christ, is to reduce and cut off bits of the body so that, you know, he can bring more into his kingdom. And it's a war of kingdoms here, just like we see in the first battle in the Bible in Genesis 14. Now, when you look at this, I want you to understand as well, there are four, four in Hebrew is the letter Dalet, right? The, the pictograph of Dalet, the four nation confederacy that bring globalism in this first battle in the Bible. There's four of them, four is Dalet, and it's a door. And, and it's what we see often when we talk about an open door right? Five is the number of grace. And I say in the midst of any spiritual battle and any battle, even this global battle that we're seeing right now, in any battle, there is a door of grace supplied to you by the Father. There is a door and an opportunity. He doesn't let you be tested without providing escape. He has created a door for you that you can walk through, that you can get through, that you can be set free through. Now, whether that's another brother or sister in Christ, whether that's someone who is praying for you, whether that's, that's, that's actual divine intervention through the Holy Spirit or through an angelic visitation, whatever it is, I am telling you right now, there is always a door available in the midst of the battle, and it is for the grace of God to manifest in your life. So don't worry about the battle, but realize that God has set before you, according to Revelation 3 and according to the Church of Philadelphia, who, by the way, are seen as of little strength. They are like, in anybody's eyes, you could look at a four nation confederacy, a five nation army, you could see. People like in that four nation confederacy, you have kings like Idol, who is literally king of nations. And then you see little Abraham. And Abraham is seen probably in the eyes of the world as not, not someone like maybe we could argue that, but one against a four nation confederacy. 
It doesn't seem, in fact, Abraham in our eyes would turn around at you going, oh, he's of little strength. Tell you what, the faithful are seen as of little strength. But we walk with the creator. We walk under the banner of the cross, under the banner of the LF, the 300. We walk under the one who sets the, the captives free. When Jesus started his ministry, when Jesus, is, and in fact, thank you, Jesus, right? The first appearance of Jesus was at 12 years old from his birth. The first time we see Jesus talk and speak and speak the words of God and be in the house of the Lord is at the age of 12. We don't see him again until he starts his ministry of 30, right? How many years in between that? 18, 318, 18 is when the bondage is finished and the victory is seen. We walk under the banner of the cross and the victory of, of the king of kings. And we come in and we may look like we've got little strength, but I, even though we look like we have little strength, Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia are told that they are overcomers. Why? Because they remain faithful to the word of God and they hold fast to his name. And I'm telling you, that is a picture that we see in Genesis 14 through the example of Abraham who stands up against a poor nation confederacy but, and stands up against and, and, and stands in the gap for those who are lost and those who are weak. It is a picture of when globalism is trying to take over this world and they're trying to subjugate you to the point that you, the, the, like Yuval Harari, the right-hand man of Klaus Schwab is said they're trying to give you that that idea that there is no such thing as free will anymore in fact Yuval Harari is quoted as saying free will is now in this age of 2022 an illusion now I'm telling you right when it, it's it, it's not true when we serve the king of kings Paul Paul when he was in prison Paul, when he was in chains, he didn't say, oh, no, look at me, I'm subjugated. Oh, no, I, the, the, the world ruling empire, Rome has me, now I'm in chains, I'm stuck, I'm, no, he says, I'm an ambassador in chains. What is an ambassador? An ambassador walks with diplomatic immunity. He is not worried about his chains. He is not subject to the laws of this world. Colossians 3 calls you a citizen of heaven. You are not uh, bowed down by the restrictions of this world. You are free in this world. So as you see globalism outstretch its arms, realize that the real target are the sheep that are off to the side. And our target in this battle is to go and to bring them back into the fold, to go and grab the prodigals, to go and look after the prodigals and bring them in. Those people who have you know, been lost to the, the, the idea that sex is their identity rather than Jesus Christ being their identity, those people, you're not to run from them nor you to realize, nor you to think they're your target. They weren't the target of Abraham in, the, in this. In fact, Abraham stood in their defense. He freed all of their goods. Your job is to run to them and set them free, establish a new identity for them. I, I've told you this again. God speaks to me primarily in dreams and visions in the word. That's, you know, in loads of different ways. But I'm telling you right now, as you see the prophetic signs line up, as you see the Queen's Jubilee happen at the time of Pentecost, and we know that there's a Queen of Heaven, we know that it's Samarimus, it's evil, it's also the heart of the Babylon. As the heart of the Babylon starts to globally centralize and globally grow, you realize that the choice is on you. Do you serve the Queen of Heaven or do you stand fast to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? He who has a name, a new name written upon his thigh, he who comes back and represents Revelation 19 on the back of a white horse and vanquishes all the armies of the enemy. That's who we serve. And when you do that, I don't care if you seem like you're of little strength. I don't, whatever spiritual battle is coming against you, you walk with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You have the banner of the cross above you. You can vanquish anyone. In fact, any enemy that stands in front of you, Luke 10, 19 says that he gives you power over every strategy, every while of that dirty dog devil. He gives you power over it all. He gives you strategy over it all. You can, you, whatever he comes against you with, every time he tries to isolate you off to the side, you go, uh, no, I'm pressing in. I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm not going to be a separate arm, a separate leg, a separate toe, a separate finger. I am part of the body of Christ. You realize that unity is where the blessing is found. Psalm 133. It is like the dew dripping off Mount Hermon. It is like the oil running down the beard of Aaron. Unity is where the blessing is found. So what does the enemy try and do? Split the flock, split the flock, cause division. And even if I'm not talking just within the, the, the body of Christ, I'm talking within your families. I'm talking within your friends. Listen, that's how the enemy comes in. He comes in to cause division. 
We should be unified under the cross, under the tab. We should be unified following the one that sets the captives free. Because I'm telling you, things are increasing at an exponential rate right now. We know that digital currencies are being developed. We know that the UK is developing. We know that China has. They've got their digital yen. We know that um, uh, Canada is developing them. The uh, US is looking into it. And we know that within the, the digital currencies, right now, at the biggest talking point that we see in the WEF meeting of 2022 last month was environmental social governance points, the idea that you as a citizen, oh, you've done well. And as you've done well, as you haven't spoke against the government, as you haven't spoke against tyranny, as you haven't called people out on their sin, as you have, as you just walked oblivious and been a mindless, uh, walking dead, autonomous sort of like robot that walks along and subjugates themselves under the systems of the world, as you've done that, we'll give you a good brownie point. You'll get a sticker. In fact, I don't know if anybody's seen that one of the things that, that was actually proposed about in back with the ESGs was licking your plate clean. Did anybody see this? I showed a couple of people who are on this. I've shown them that video, that if you lick your plate clean, you can actually get brownie points from, you know, from uh, brownie ESGs, right? So you get an extra point on your environmental social governance score. Now, here's the, the, the other side of this. If you, if you, disobey then what it comes under this if you take the chinese social credit system as an example if you disobey then you won't be able to buy certain things in fact they've already brought up the likes of prescription drugs so if you've got an ailment got something that you know is a a constant thing with you then they're looking for control they're looking for subjugation they're looking nothing different nothing new under the sun it is the same old ploy of men because men are trying to create themselves as gods when there is only one and this is what i want to try and get through to you guys because if you understand what has happened in the world it's not listen it's not scary i know some of you on here will turn around and say it's scary it's not this is the most amazing time for you to be alive Think about this, right? God knew that you, let me see, God knew that you, Donna, Gary, Simon, Linda, you know, they knew, God knew that you would be born into this age. And as you were born into this age, he ordained it, that you would be a child of faith. And you would be a child of faith who had the ability to shine his light in these days. Now that is amazing. So as the darkness increases, he put everything there. He, you're, you're his chosen for this age. He chose you. He ordained you. Anyone who is in the church, the global church, anybody who's, who's walking with Christ right now, you are chosen to be alive at this age. I just think that's amazing. And I, you don't fear the, the increase of the darkness. You realize that you're part of the 318, that you serve the one who brandishes the cross, you serve the one who sets the, sets the captives free, that even if you end up being an ambassador in chains, you do what Paul did, and you convert those who are guarding you. You know, I, I've told this story before, that the legend goes that when Paul was guarded, they used to, they had to restrict the times the guards spent with him. So if he had a guard on him, two guards on him for 24 hours, the problem was is they were converted to Christianity within the 24 hour period, and the, the Roman authorities weren't happy, so they, they changed and made the shifts shorter. This is where the, uh, the story goes. And as they made the shifts sh shorter, Paul's rhetoric and his ability to share the gospel just got more refined and quicker, and people got started getting saved at a quicker pace. I'm telling you, look, that, that, that we, scripture that we see there, let me go back to Genesis 14. I'm getting excited, and I apologize. I, I try and keep myself a wee bit calm sometimes but he brought back verse 16 all the goods that means that in the time of conflict in the time in which globalism is trying to subjugate the world is trying to rule the world is trying to make a, a world in which you can't move left or right without the government say so in that time god has said for the 318 it's time to go out and bring back all the goods that means everyone who has has ever heard the gospel, everyone who hasn't heard the gospel, everyone who has been lied to and thought that their identity is based on how they feel and based on, you know, what they want to be and that rather than what the gospel says, 
you're to go out and get back all those goods. That's what the call is now. This is the time now. We are to set the captives free. We are to run with the word of God. We are to speak out the truth of his word. And we are to bring back all the goods. And we don't do it for our own uh, glory. This is a time, I've said this on Sunday, for the sycamore seeds to rise. It is a time for people to see Jesus more clearly. I said this on Sunday. Zacchaeus was known for climbing the sycamore tree. The dream that I had of the sycamore seed rising. And that, that this is a prophetic dream. And I personally believe this is for now. I believe that it is time for those who are dying to themselves, those who are letting Jesus be seen more clearly, to go out and return all the goods in the midst of this battle. Now, the, the problem is, is the devil wants you confused. He wants you looking to the right or to the left. He wants you see, looking at those people who are trapped in sexual confusion, who are running after the, the flesh. He wants to see you, them, for you to see them as your enemy. That's not your enemy. They're your, they're your targets. They're the ones you to go and set free, right? They're the ones you to go after and get all those goods back. Set free the prodigals. Bring the prodigals back. It's time for the trumpet. It's time for the shofar to sound. This is what your calling is right now. And I personally believe that the prophetic dream I had, and I shared on Sunday, and if you haven't seen it, guys, I, I, I counsel you to go back and actually look at our Pentecost service on Sunday because I shared it on Sunday, and it's a dream that's still speaking to me. And I had affirmation and confirmation about this, that uh, the rising of the sycamores, that's what's happening right now, where those who are of lowlands, sycamores uh, grew in the lowlands in First Chronicles, are being replaced in the cedars. Isaiah 9, 10, they're bringing up into a highland uh, area. Why? Because it is time for the world to see Jesus clearly. And they will see Jesus clearly because you can get caught up and you think, no, 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 why? Ooh, that person's just, oh, look, they, they, they think that they're, uh, they, they sexually identify as a duck. Oh, I can't, I can't speak to them. Yes, you can. It's your mandate. Go and speak to them and tell them, hold on a minute, wake up. That's not who you are. You're called a child of God. Jesus wants you in his family. His heart is that none should perish and all should come to the knowledge of him. Go out and share the gospel with them. Amen. Guys, if you're if you're getting this, please, I, I'll, I'll sum up very, very quickly, but please let me know. Hit a one if you're getting this, because guys, I think in the time of conflict is to realize that there's an, always a door open to grace to be seen. And there's a target that God has put out for each and every one of you. It is time to go out and set those who are lost in confusion free by bringing them back into the fold. To call back the prodigals, the children, the family members that you've been believing for who are lost in confusion and believe in the lies of globalism as globalism outstretches its arm. Believe in the lies of this globalist regime as it goes bigger and bigger and says this is the way forward that salvation could be found at Davos. Uh, no, salvation is found in one and one alone, and that is Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father but by him. If this is uh, true to you, if this is making sense to you, let me know, because I'm believing that right now it's time to take him, not at random. The target in the battle is not random, although it may appear so. The enemy has a target against you, and it's not just you. It's your friends, it's your family, it's your co-workers, it's your, it's your kids. That's the target. Whenever he tries to come and attack you, that's the target, right? That's the target. And whenever you know that, you realize that, hold on a minute, they're targeting the suffering that I'm going through isn't just against me. It is to make my kids fall into disbelief. It is to make my kids fall into the ways of the world. No, then you can stand up and rise and say, no, I'm not going to be part of that. I'm going to be part of the 318. I'm going to step away and I'm going to free the captives. And those captives, maybe your friends, maybe your family members, maybe your kids, maybe your loved ones, maybe your husband, your wife, whoever it is. But your job is to set the captives free. I'm going to share this and I'm going to go, right? In the time of the battle, remember the four and the five. Listen. Four and five, there's four, uh, four armies, confederacy, five army, confederacy. That makes nine. Nine is a number of the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the giftings of the Holy Spirit, sorry. And nine is also a number of judgment. It is a job, which it's, it's a choice right now. Which one do you walk in? The, the judgment of the Holy, the judgment of God or walk in the fruit and the power of the Holy Spirit? I know which one I choose, but I tell you this. I had a dream that and I shared this before and I was on... Uh, I was with the church and we were on this sort of like pier, like a wooden deck out just in the sea. 
and we were looking over the sea and I saw so many people I know through church, right? You know, other pastors that I know well, people um, who I've known, in, you know, from the kingdom that for, for years now, they went and they got on a boat and they just went. They were, they knew that the battle was here and they got on the boat and they left and they took themselves off. But as I'm standing there, I heard the Holy Spirit within the dream tell me to turn around and run toward the battle. And I knew there were 200 coming on to this de- at this pier, 200. And I knew that they were all embroiled in uh, satanic worship. I knew that they were all demon possessed. I knew that they were all suffering under the subjugation of the enemy. And we were to run toward them. And as we ran toward them, everyone we talked to, everyone we touched, Everyone we laid hands on was set free, was born again, and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we were doing this so that the two, full 200 were saved. And what happened is we realized then as we were doing it, there were boards missing from this deck, all these boards missing. And God instructed us to put the boards back. In other words, to give the identity back to those whose identity has been stolen. We're living in a time where Generation Z do not know what way is up. You have a choice. Do you stand on the solid rock of your identity, Matthew 16, 18, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he's the Lord and Savior, and our identity is in him, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? Or do you stand on sand, sinking sand? And I'm telling you right now, this is what we're called to do. We're called to bring as many people onto the solid foundation of who Jesus is and who they are in Jesus. The, those who are stuck in sexual confusion, identity confusion, they're not the enemy. They're the targets. They're the people that we go and we rescue and we bring back all the goods. We bring them back from the confusion of the world in the midst of the battle. So globalism is raging. It's rising and it's raging right now. I mean, it's not even just a, it's not even a theory now. They're extremely open. I am a nerd, right? And I sit and I've watched hours and hours and hours of the, the uh, of Davos from uh, last month. And some of the stuff coming out of there, when you say it to someone, it makes you think, it makes you sound like they're a crazy person, but this is what they're saying. And if you notice this, you know, people were going, well, Davos was different this year because you didn't have the, the G7 at it. You didn't need the G7 at it because Klaus Schwab has been very, very clear that he has infiltrated as in the sense that uh, half of the, uh, well, the majority of the G7 and their cabinets were all um, graduates from the uh, World Global Leaders School, his school. They're all singing off the same hymn sheet. That's why we know in in Canada, because Justin Trudeau was a graduate, We know that in Canada, that he's already, you can actually YouTube it, half of the cabinet are all graduates from the WEF uh, Global Leaders School. They don't need them all to come and sit at the meeting because they are all doing what they've been told to do. In fact, if you think of it like a commission, Klaus Schwab has given them the commission, go out and subjugate and control. And they're all going out and doing it. But Jesus has given us a commission Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the little commission in Matthew 10, 8, bap, uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. This is the commission upon us. And look, honestly, whether it's a case of standing on the street and preaching, whether it's a case of going to your family members, your loved ones, sharing the gospel, sharing the truth of the word, you're called to all do it. So if it's a case, it's not a, it's not a case of everybody's got to be a Billy Graham. It's a case of everybody's got to actually do the work that we're commissioned to do, which is to speak out truth, set the captives free. I'm telling you right now, one of the biggest fears I have is I see this generation Z coming through and I see what they've had within the schooling system. And I see what they've been um, subjugated with and subjugated by within the schooling system, indoctrinated with. And it breaks my heart. But you guys, me, you can set them free. 
give them their identity in Jesus Christ. The target in the battle for those of the 318 are the lost and the prodigals. Amen. So, guys, I hope this made sense. If you have any questions, uh, throw them up now. Um, if it made sense to you, if you got something from it, please hit one. Um, and, guys, what's this? Let me see. Can't get out and share anything when you're waiting two plus years and healing and getting worse. Listen. Nikki, you share by being on here, you share by talking to um, Abby and Casey, and you share by being a light. It doesn't mean that you have to, to always be out in the street. And actually, see on here, you're a media missionary. The more you share this teaching, the more you share these teachings, the more you share uh, the truth of scripture on here. It's never been easier in that way. And listen, you know, you're healing. I'm believing it's coming. I'm believing it's here. You've already been healed in the past. You know that. So I am believing there's more coming. And listen, there's, there's, don't be afraid of the battle. Don't be distracted with the battle. The battle is to get you to hunker down and think, oh, look at all this. This is terrible. No. Find your target in the battle. And your target is the lost and the prodigals. Guys, does this make sense? Um, if it does, just give me a, a comment, please. And then I'm going to let you go. Or you're going to let me go or one or the other. Um, and we'll pray. So if it made sense, just let me know, please. Father God, I just thank you for your people. I thank you that they are part of the 318. I thank you that, Lord, I thank you that they are under the banner of the 300, under the banner of the cross, the Tav. I thank you that they are walking under the King of Kings, who is he who sets the captives free. And I thank you that in the midst of a battle raging on earth, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of all this, Lord, that they are not distracted, they are not put off by this, but they run straight for the lost. They call back the prodigals. They set free the captives. And Lord, I thank you that they are a blessing to those they're around. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I've got a few comments there, a few ones and stuff. So guys, if you did get something from it, please let me know. If you didn't, you can let me know too, but I probably won't pay attention. Um, so join us on Sunday. Um, we have a, a great service planned on Sunday. And we are, listen, I, I, can't, I can't share enough how much is unfolding prophetically. I'm wondering if I have 30 seconds, if I can share something really quick. Shared it with my mentoring team last night. Yeah, we'll do it. Right, so I had a dream last week. I'm not sure, I'm not going to share names, but I had a dream last week that um, a guy that we knew, uh, we knew really well from one of our, from our homeless outreach, from our street church. I had a dream of him that, anyway, he was going to do something to himself. And God woke me up with this dream. And I told some of the team and they says, right, we have to go out. It wasn't scheduled to go out on Sunday, but we went out on Sunday and we had street church on Sunday night. I'm going to just tell you this really, really quickly. Do you mind? Um, and as we went out on Sunday night and the team uh, were out, we were going through and we were praying with people. We were feeding people. Uh, we fed quite a lot. Um, we, we actually got to the lights, like the traffic lights, and I, um, we were trying to make a decision which way to go. And I said, well, here, let's go up this way. And we went up this way and we saw the individual from my dream who ha we hadn't seen in some time. And it was amazing, right? We were able to sit on the street with him. We're all sitting on the ground. He had a Bible. We got out the Bible. Uh, we went through uh, different things in Revelation 3, giving him his identity absolutely amazing when we were walking back he shared with me that the thing that i had seen in my dream he was going to do and we had spent maybe an hour 45 minutes two hours with him and as we were sitting there what was amazing as well so i got a dream instruction from god go out and see this guy he needs to see he needs to see you right as we were sitting there i got a text from someone in the church who works in a hostel um, and they said they named him and they said if you see this guy called um please stop and pray with him now i took a picture because i as and he, i showed the text to him because we're sitting there and praying with him and he says he couldn't get over it that you know god had given me a dream to go out and see him 
and God was surrounding him with people who were concerned about him and who were Christian. And then we went through Revelation 3 and gave him his identity, you know, who he is in Christ. I just thought this was amazing. God is speaking. The spirit of God is speaking. There's so much to it, but I can't all share it. I can't share it all in here. But guys, do, do you get that? Like God is speaking right now. Do you not find that amazing that he just instructs you? That's why Job 33 verse 14 says that he instructs you through dreams and visions of the night so that you don't fall to pride. Sometimes he has to wait for you to shut off the noise and listen. And we went out and he didn't do the thing that I I had seen him do in the dream. Um, he didn't do it. William, you know how powerful it was because you were there. And it, it's he didn't do it. He, he, in fact, ended up getting back to the hostel and telling the individual from church all about the experience tonight and or that night. And um, what was amazing, actually, we had walked back with him to another uh, group of people um, on the street and he started sharing how you know, we were motivated by a dream to go out and find him tonight to, so that he wouldn't do this thing. And another person was texting and stuff while we were there and how powerful it was and how it impacted him. God is after the prodigals right now and he is calling back those who have, who have made a decision at one point and started walking away. And he is after the lost and he is calling us to be part of the 318. So listen, I'm telling you, Sunday night was powerful. It has sat with me so strongly since. And I am not ignoring a word from God or, you know, suppressing a dream again. I am just, I, we all need, yes, the spirit of God is on the move, Helen. And I think we all need to be just listening to what the spirit of God is saying because people's lives depend on it, literally. So guys, God bless. I call you the head and not tail above and not beneath. Kings, queens, and high priests in Jesus' name. You can do all things through he who strengthens you. You're overcomers. You're more than conquerors. And you have power over every strategy of the enemy. So go out and be part of the 318. Amen. Guys, God bless. I'll see you all on Sunday.